Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Managing High Water and High Tension Along the Great Lakes Shoreline. Um, my name is Jim Olson. I'm the founder and uh, legal advisor uh, at Flow for Love and Water here in the Great Lakes of the Law and Policy Center for topics uh, like the one we're addressing today. I'm gonna to have two roles today. One is to moderate and, uh, and address some housekeeping items uh, at first. And then secondly, I'll do a brief overview to uh, uh, tee the program off this, this afternoon for our uh, three uh, co-panelists uh, who I will <clears throat> introduce uh, shortly. Uh, note that this is a recorded session. It's gonna be 75 minutes long, that's to, uh, 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 2.15. Um, also note that uh, uh, there's a Q&A button. Uh, do not use chat for questions. Use the Q&A button and we've got that up and people will be monitoring the questions. Uh, and if some questions don't get answered, there will be follow-up um, to the extent that we can. Uh, and of course, uh, we have resource material links that are being provided throughout the session uh, by staff. And I want to thank the FLOW staff, the Executive Director, Ms. Kirkwood and um, Kelly Thayer, and particularly Nate Boyd, that does a lot of the coordination of all of this. Uh, thank you. So um, I want to introduce briefly the, the panelists. Um, uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, three people that have been on the front lines uh, of the water level issues, uh, particularly focused in Southwest Michigan. And um, I, want to, I want to introduce briefly Jared Sanders. He's here from the Water Research Division of Eagle. Jared, thank you for being here. Um, David Bunte is, talk about being on the hot seat and leading people through the high waters. Uh, we have the supervisor of Chickamauga Township who uh, has been, uh, as I said, in the, in, in the, on the front line of this and has developed an ordinance and uh, is working on planning and has worked with uh, uh, Dr. Meadows uh, from the science standpoint and Dr. Norton, um, one from Michigan Tech, Dr. Norton from U of M. So um, <clears throat> that uh, is very exciting because this has been in the works for some time and high waters hit and here's a township that was able to respond. Scott Howard is an attorney and uh, I'm thankful to say a partner in the law firm of Wilson Duzak and Howard. Scott does a number of significant uh, lawsuits and uh, clients and range of work. But he's done a lot of work in Southwest Michigan on a lot of different issues from Saugatuck South and even North. Uh, and Scott uh, had the direct experience of uh, assisting Chickaming Township and David as well as uh, representing and lead counsel for the firm uh, before Eagle, that is Jared's division, uh, in um, a proceeding that resulted in the denial of permits uh, under Part 3, 323 of the uh, uh, Shoreline Prediction Act. So, um, um, welcome uh, and let's get started. If the Panelists, you can, you can go ahead and turn off your cameras and I'll, uh, I'll start in. So <clears throat> I'm going to do a pre, uh, just a brief uh, uh, overview and some framework here. Um, you know, this is Flo's 10th year this year. And I want to mention that uh, we, we've, uh, we've come a long way and are excited for our next 10 years. Our mission has been to uh, advance and understand water law and Great Lakes law and the ecosystem of pollution and quantity, uh, and particularly in a public trust framework. We believe this is cutting edge work because the public trust harmonizes and create, creates a unifying principle that cuts across a lot of jurisdictional boundaries. And I think that's true for some of the issues we're uh, speaking about today. We do a lot of other programs, line five and access to safe and portable water, privatization, commodification, and now the new financialization efforts by Wall Street, and we look forward to the next 10 years. Um, we all, I'd also like to um, um, uh, mention the uh, uh, recognition that, you know, we sit here uh, from an 1836 treaty, 
we sit here in this land in the Great Lakes by, by many tribal treaties and uh, particularly where we sit during this webinar, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we're sitting on the lands of the uh, Anishinaabek people, Adaba, Ojibwa, and uh, Bawadne nations, um, uh, protected, whose rights were protected and fish rights protected by the Treaty of 1836. Um, so they're part of the ancestral heritage. And uh, we need to often think of ourselves as not only uh, the heritage of Europe, but uh, being part of this same land and water shared uh, by all of us uh, with responsibility and key relationship of how we relate to each other and, and the Great Lakes. So, um, so from that, uh, let's, let's move right into the uh, program. Uh, if you would put up slide one, uh, uh, the public trust doctrine is an ancient doctrine. Um, you can look here just briefly, every state in the nation, including uh, Michigan and all Great Lakes states receive sovereign title to uh, all the animal waters within their boundaries and all the bottomlands um, beneath those waters and beneath the ordinary high water mark. Because the waters of the Great Lakes, even though we think of them at any moment in time when we look at them as being stable, they're anything but. Uh, uh, recently, I was in California, and then, of course, all the other events that are happening, flooding in Detroit, the, the, the fires, and, and uh, I don't have to repeat all of that. But if anything today, uh, water levels are uncertain. There's less predictability, and we have this challenge in science and law and policy to uh, uh, figure out ways in which to understand that this six foot change, and I'm uh, that's roughly approximate, from low to high in the Great Lakes Basin isn't going to be every 13 years or whatever the time period is. It was just recently six or seven. And uh, it's time to remove that time frame and cycle out of there and understand that if you compress the time, we have uh, changes in water levels in the Great Lakes Basin with equal impacts just under natural conditions uh, exacerbated by climate change, which are as much as the coast tidal impacts, which of course occur daily. But again, uh, this is one of our challenges. And, and I like the fact that we live in a public trust doctrine state because right along public trust, you have uh, private lands and then there's uh, upland and riparian rights. and and you have adjacent owner rights, you have public access rights. Uh, so you have this public trust framework and then upland riparian rights um, in which people have the right to use and enjoy the water, which we'll go over those uh, real briefly. And then you have a regulatory framework, the ordinary high water mark. And as you can see, the ordinary high water mark in the Spurs Lands Act is 37.9, that's supposed to be 0.8 feet, so I apologize, apologize for that. So you have the Submerged Lands Act, and then in between in this gray area here, uh, or tan area, uh, um, the up upper line is the glass and gecko caves. And of course, the recent Indiana case adopted the same idea, and that's the natural ordinary high. Well, we know from the Burleson case that, that uh, there's a, a jurisdictional uh, gap here, uh, and I'm sure the township and Scott Howard and, and, our, and uh, Jerry will, will address this, Jurisdictional gap, and, and, and there'll be a discussion on how they handle this, uh, Part 323 ordinance, uh, uh, and how, how hopefully in the Q&A this will be, this will be handled, handled, handled in the future. So, um, so uh, if we would go to the next slide. Yeah, real quick. So public trust protects the navigation, fishing, fishing, swimming, boating, recreation, sustenance. It covers a lot of lands of special character, but particularly navigable waters in the lands below the ordinary or natural ordinary high water mark. Um, and uh, next slide. And of course, just as a reminder, riparians have these specific rights uh, that, that are listed here, bathing, swimming, domestic use, need, needs uh, in connection with the property, use, use rights, wharfing, docking, mooring, <clears throat> access to navigable waters, and the right to accretions, which are sort of a permanent gradual not to return. You know, that's something different than the uh, temporal uh, effects and forces, uh, for example, under glass and gecko. So, um, okay, next slide. Um, I, I, I've list, just listed a few of the relevant statutes. Uh, we have a resource uh, handout here that will address, uh, well, that lists these statutes and more with the citations and a brief summary. 
Um, so um, I want to I want to end just with a discussion about framework. Um, I think I, I think what we we are called to do here is look to a more holistic framework in a context much larger than even the problem itself. Um, and for example, water levels, and particularly with climate change, the problem has existed before. It's not going away. We lose shorelands erode uh, so many feet a year. None of that changes. Climate change, though, is changing the intensity, the frequency, and sort of an unknown. Uh, 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 characterization and reality of impacts. So it drives us to say, look at the holistic here. We have a public trust framework. We have different jurisdictional boundaries. We got bottom lands. We got these the, the gap land that I described. Riparian lands, they're in a watershed. They're in a hydrologic cycle affected by climate change. They are surrounded in, in part of the wetland in, in a context of floodplains and, and wetlands. And so we are looking at something here that is not just one problem in one place, it is one problem in a much larger context in which we are now challenged to harmonize our laws, jurisdictional overlaps, use science that recognizes that these jurisdictional boundaries and laws may be uh, incorrectly drawn or at the very least need to be based on science levels, weather forecasting, creating certain zones in which we have uniform standards like impacts on the environment and public trust and no feasible and prudent alternative, which is some of the principles that are explicit and if not explicit implied in those laws and certainly in the common law the public trust document of Great Lakes. So I'm gonna turn it over to the panel. Uh, uh, we are really um, thrilled and excited that, that uh, you're with us today, all of you and um, the panelists are here. Um, so, um, uh, as I approach each, uh, each of the panelists, I'm going to give a more detailed uh, uh, introduction. So, Jared Sanders. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate, uh, appreciate being here. I'm Assistant Division Director in Water Resources um, for EGLE. Um, in a general sense, I, I oversee um, what we call our resource programs, which is um, wetlands and lakes and streams, floodplains. Um, and then for the primary part of the last couple years, our, uh, our shoreline programs. So next slide. Yeah, I'm gonna interrupt just a minute. Jared, is, Jared uh, has been with EGO since uh, 2012. And he has oh. a degree of natural resources management from Grand Valley and a master's of science in agriculture technology systems focused on environmental and hydrologic issues from Michigan State University. Go ahead, Jerry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, Jim, I jumped the gun there a little bit. So just introduce myself. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, primarily today sort of about uh, Eagle's involvement and, and focus really on the crisis part of it and then touch on you know uh, steps forward a little bit at the end there. Um, so next slide. So I, in essence, I mean, the Great Lakes water levels and inland lake water levels are controlled prim primarily by climate. We don't have a lot of um, man-made controls um, to address these, uh, the fluctuations that were natural and now uh, likely being impacted by climate change. Um, so uh, in essence, uh, you know, we just went through pretty much the wettest short and long-term period on, uh, on record in our 120, 130 years of, of weather records. Um, that caused uh, both uh, inland and Great Lakes water levels to go up rapidly and uh, in turn cause a lot of catastrophic impacts um, uh, across the landscape. Yeah, and at the end of the day, and when I say existing support and response systems, I, I don't just mean uh, public sector. Certainly, there were incredible challenges for state, local, federal government, um, but also in the private sector. I mean, ultimately, our sort of society isn't, isn't geared up for this type of crisis that uh, encompasses, you know, an entire region of the country, you know, all the Great Lakes had these had these challenges. And so 
Um, that uh, put a lot of stress on the system. I'm really proud of how my uh, folks responded and of how you know people in all those sectors responded, um, but it was a unique challenge. So next slide. So this is just to reinforce that a little bit. If you go to the end of, uh, end of 2019 and you look back uh, 12 months from that, that is the wettest 12 month period uh, in our uh, weather records. Again, 120, 130 years, it's one of those two, I might be saying it wrong. Um, so, you know, short term, incredibly wet year, wettest one, uh, wettest 12 months we've ever had. But if you go to that same point and look back two years, three years, five years, um, the wettest long-term patterns within that record. So an incredible amount of water, and that's the driver here. Next slide. So looking at the Great Lakes water levels long-term, we do see, Jim talked about this a little bit. I mean, ultimately it is it is cyclical. You see the, this is all five of the, um, oh, I, I here on, or uh, uh, Ontario's not on here, but, uh, um, but it's uh, for the Great Lakes and Lake St. Clair. You see these squiggly lines um, annually. Those are annual uh, high and low cycles, um, which are uh, you know, relatively consistent. We also see these long-term trends, you know, 30, 20, sometimes 15 years between these periods of, of high and low water. So high waters happened before. Low waters happened before, and it's going to continue to go like this. It's going to continue to happen again. So next slide. So where do we stand right now? Um, all of the Great Lakes, uh, monthly record highs in either 2019 or 2020 or both. Um, where we stand today, they've all declined pretty substantially, um, and they're you know essentially predicted, at least over the next six months, to continue um, uh, that, that decline, uh, at this point now in all the Great Lakes, we're actually closer to the long-term monthly long-term averages than we are those, those, um, record highs. Uh, if you look at this slide, I also included, you know, one of the pieces of information that's been long debated during this crisis is, is, you know, how do we manage our way out of this? And short answer is, is we really can't, uh, when we go through a weather cycle, like we just did. Um, the man-made points of control in the Great Lakes Basin, the, the lakes are kind of oriented in the, as the flow of water as it travels through the system here. Um, there are a couple of diversions into the basin in Lake Superior, hydroelectric diversions. Um, we obviously have some control of flow between Superior and Michigan and Sioux Locks. But then we really can't, uh, as humans, control the flow between the lakes until the very outlet at, at Lake Huron. Um, there's some control about whether um, we put more water over Niagara Falls between Erie and Huron, whether we put more water over Niagara Falls or more um, through the canal, but we really can't control, um, you know, the, the total amount of water is generally saving. We're just sending it one direction or another, but it's still going the same direction. So we really can't manage our way out of this. It's about the weather. Next slide. So I mentioned impacts all across the state. This is, I'm gonna roll through these pretty quickly, but uh, this is uh, M185 on Mackinac Island, uh, late 2019, I believe. This is M25, St. Louis County, major MDOT thoroughfare. Next slide. Um, this is Lakeshore Boulevard in Marquette. This road has now been in a managed retreat, uh, moved back and away from the Lakeshore a little bit. I was just there a month ago, a little bit, and checked it out. Um, a really great project, but as you can see, um, you know, the power of the Great Lakes is uh, really sort of unmatched. Um, next slide. So certainly erosion got a lot of the attention um, over the last, I guess, couple of years now. Um, that was sort of ever in everyone's um, you know, the forefront is in the forefront is in the news and getting a lot of the attention and a lot of the perm, a lot of our permitting attention. But um, in uh, lower lying areas, this is uh, Harsons Island at the outlet of St. Clair River. Um, in the lower lying areas, there were huge impacts in terms of coastal flooding and normal flood. You know, waters go up and they come back down, and you deal with the aftermath. 
you know, this is long-term type of flooding and has incredible challenges on infrastructure. How do you continue to treat wastewater? How do you continue to deliver clean drinking water? What about pollution sources, underground storage tanks, all those things. And so there is incredible amount of damage for our, in our cities, uh, villages, um, and townships from, from this type of impact, depending on what the coastal landscape is like. Next slide. And um, this is, you know, still a problem. We haven't seen as much relief here as we have on the coast, but uh, inland lake flooding, particularly Kettle Lakes, uh, hundreds if not thousands of lakes are in some degree of flooding uh, inland. And frankly, the solutions for these are very, very challenging. Um, when you've got too much water in inland systems, how do you move water from one place to another? Uh, how do you relieve someone's flooding without causing a problem someplace else or moving invasive species around? These are not simple solutions. Um, next slide. So what do we do about this? Ultimately, there was uh, really a need to expedite our, de our decisions. Um, we really tried to protect the integrity of the decision-making process, but we had to make those decisions and get feedback out to folks that are dealing with, in some cases, emergencies, sort of one day, one week decisions, not, not month decisions. So we did need to speed that up. We, we tried very hard to protect the integrity of that decision-making process. Um, that involves certainly some, some process changes on our end um, and uh, moving resources and over time out to the lakeshore. Um, we also made some customer service improvements in terms of getting information out to the public, how to get in and out of our processes, um, how to find a contractor, those types of things, a uh, dedicated web page, uh, a call center that we staffed um, five days a week, um, and frankly, getting out in public doing webinars and uh, interviews and things like that. So uh, next slide. So um, Jim talked about these a little bit. Um, I'm just going to touch on them basically. So the primary Great Lakes regulations that we, you know, that came into play during the crisis, um, probably the main one in terms of permitting was part 325. That's Great Lakes submerged lands, um, requires permitting for dredge fill structures, uh, anytime you're messing around in bottomlands, but below these statutory ordinary high watermark elevations, and that elevation is not the not the elevation of the water, but the bottom land at that location, um, for a substantial part of the crisis, um, that ordinary high watermark was submerged, and so ab above that. Um, uh, for historically and going back to the previous really bad high water crisis in the mid 80s, um, Eagles interpreted the law that when the water goes above that, those ordinary high water mark levels that we still retain permitting authority of the water's edge. Um, that changed midway through the crisis. Um, one of the cases Jim referenced was the Burleson case in 2011. Um, that's a precedent setting case. And so um, we did we did not um, you know, we didn't catch it. We were frankly challenged on it um, and had to change midstream in terms of, you know, right at the height of the high water crisis, change that interpretation that we couldn't require permits under uh, part 325 before it was above the ordinary high water mark. Um, so part 353 is critical dune statute and uh, part 323 is high risk erosion areas. Both of those are, are sort of designated areas um, so the regulations don't apply across all the Great Lakes the way it does in 325. Um, in critical dune areas, those are designated in statute high-risk erosion areas. Um, that statute is primarily about um, putting constraints on buildings and structures that are built uh, based on the rate of recession of the bluff. Um, so within 30 years, where is that bluff going to be? Um, and what constraints are on construction within that setback. Six, there's a 60 year um, um, setback calculation in there too. And then um, what came into play later in the crisis was um, there, this is not under NREPA or the, I should have prefaced that, but NREPA or Natural Resources Environmental Protection Act is a state statute that a lot of these environmental uh, statutes were uh, agglomerated in. So, um, Section 401 of the Clean Water Act uh, 
deals with state water quality certification. So almost all these projects require a, a permit from the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, historically, when we would issue a part 325 permit, that certification also was automatically covered under that and went to the Corps so the Corps could there issue their permit. They can't issue theirs until they have a, a, a water quality certification from the state. Uh, once we lost that uh, permitting authority above the ordinary high water mark, but still in the water, that 401 certification program came into play. Um, so we certainly still maintain the level of regulatory authority um, within those areas, but it became inordinately more complicated as we were trying to work our way through the crisis. Um, next slide. Um, next slide. I'm going to for brevity, I'm gonna move past that one. So um, on the left-hand side there, you see my uh, six-month-old pup, Walter. Um, there are a lot of challenges, and frankly, some of the days it felt like we were trapped outside in the rain here. Um, it, it certainly was a, was a tough two years. There was a lot of pressure um, on those decisions. Um, you know, the if you look at some of the photos, particularly from early on in the crisis, there were homes, foundations, septic tanks, hanging over the edge, people were getting ready to roads, uh, businesses, people were getting ready to lose um, things that are most important to them. And so, you know, you'll see our permitting numbers, but, we, you know, in one year we had, you know, 2,200 customers that the most important thing to them was what we were working on. Uh, and so there's a lot of pressure on those decisions. And again, our, our goal is to, you know, protect the environment and implement the statute. So, uh, trying to find that balance was tough. Um, we're frankly not staffed up. Um, you'll see it's a, for a six, seven fold increase in, in uh, permit applications. And frankly, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot of uh, challenges in terms of what we could control and what we couldn't, what permitting timeframes were, what we would permit, what we wouldn't. Um, there were a lot of challenges with really trying get the right information out there. I think that's pretty consistent in the crisis. A um, couple other things went on too, sort of at the height of that crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, we shifted to work from home. Um, we lost staffing hours. We were kind of surviving on overtime. Our staff were working weekends and holidays in some cases to try to uh, maintain workflow. And suddenly we had layoff days. So not only could we not work overtime, but we lost 20% of um, our FTEs. Um, dedicated to this. And then we had the uh, Michigan Dam failures, which is the same people. It's the same uh, units. Um, some of the same people had to redirect to deal with those issues. Um, one of the big challenges was that most of the other Great Lakes states, to some degree, deregulated to deal with this issue. Um, they most inst instituted some type of policy where um, folks could go out and it install their revetments and then, you know, we're obligated to come in after the fact. Um, we really felt like if, if Michigan went that way, that we would have a lot of uh, bad structures in the ground, that it would be almost impossible to, to do the follow up and come back and, and make the corrections that were necessary. When you start talking about revetments, um, they all have costs, they all have negative consequences, but where you put it, how you put it, how you install it, what type you install makes a huge difference. And so we really felt it was important to keep that upfront sort of uh, regulatory oversight to the program. Um, and then uh, um, I mentioned the regulatory boundary change, which happened in May of 2020, which was pretty much the peak out of, of, <laughs> of the high water that we had to work our way through. Um, again, didn't cost us, didn't make us put bad projects in the ground, but was exceptionally costly in terms of administration. Um, next slide. Um, so I mentioned an inordinate increase in the amount of permits, uh, you know, eight or nine times what we did in, in 2014, and then over a normal year, six to seven times increase. So in a 12 month period, you know, almost 2,300 uh, Lake shoreline permits went through. Um, next slide, and you can move past this one too. Um, for brevity. So what do we do? There's Walter again. Walter became the star of my presentation when I was finishing up my slides yesterday and I turned around and saw that, that he was eating my wife's belt and uh, had torn up uh, a box. 
Uh, so I felt I should incorporate that for a little bit of fun in the presentation. So what, what, you know, what do we do looking at it from the aftermath of it? I will say, first of all, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of how the department responded um, to, the, to the crisis. That doesn't mean we were perfect. We made some mistakes um, and you know, not every outcome uh, is a good one, but I, but I do think we made um, timely choices and in, in some of the right choices. So as I mentioned, our staff re response was incredible. It took a 60 to 90 day uh, typical permitting process with even with that increase uh, in the midst of our heaviest permitting year ever. Um, in all of our programs and um, took that down to an average of 14 days sort of at the height of the crisis when things were really bad. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, not a single home or business was lost um, due, to, due to delays on our part. And we did maintain that regulatory oversight through those challenges, through, um, you know, uh, not only through the, um, you know, change in the, um, change in the interpretation, um, but also with other states taking a different direction. And one of the things the public doesn't see is that uh, very seldomly does a project come in that is permitted exactly like it came in. We required changes to thousands of those projects um, to make sure that the that impacts are minimized to, to, to the ability that they can be. Um, so not so good, we certainly made some mistakes. Um, when you're sprinting like that, um, we weren't perfect. We, but we did um, take feedback and try to adapt on the fly and make, you know, try to avoid re repeating the mistakes that we made. Um, and uh, frankly, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of hard armor got out there. We know long-term hard armor isn't, um, isn't, isn't good for Great Lakes processes. So next slide. So what's gonna happen now? Ultimately, uh, water levels are gonna go down. We hope that we're out of the woods now, but they are gonna go down eventually. And frankly, they're gonna come back up, uh, maybe sooner, uh, depending on what the impacts of climate change are. And so we need to do something about that. So next slide. So some of the challenges that are out there with what we do now, um, certainly we have a lot of non-compliance out there. We were really focused on getting um, permits out and you know upfront regulatory oversight. We know we have a lot of compliance issues and violations out there that we got that we have to prioritize and 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 deal with. And and you know resources are still very thin. Um, you know again we're not staffed up to have this level of input sort of coming in and a fire hose all at once. Um, and, you know, ultimately we've lost staff in the program over the years. The fees haven't been increased uh, since 1995 for most of these programs. And so um, we're working on that this year and we're hopeful on it, but uh, um, we need resources to be able to do the job. Um, and then, you know, from a standpoint of everyone, federal, local, us, um, the community, the private sector, we need to stay focused, in my opinion. Um, I think that uh, the new cycle is going to move on. Water levels go back down. That's not the current emergency that's out there. And so, um, but I do think we need to we need to make some changes um, to so we don't put ourselves in this position again where we're stuck between doing things we know aren't good um, for long term for the lakes um, and uh, uh, um, or letting houses or businesses or roads fall in. So. Um, climate change, uh, the predictions are for more volatility in uh, Great Lakes water levels, so more rapid swings between high and low, maybe higher highs and lower lows. Um, and then there's this erosion dependency um, problem that we have in terms of our, our beaches and dunes are dependent on ongoing erosion. The Great Lakes shorelines have been eroding for a long time. Um, those beaches and dunes are dependent on that sand supply from some of that um, erosion. And so um, we have this we have this this inherent challenge between when we put a bunch of infrastructure development right on those bluffs, right on the lakeshore. How do we balance those two things? Um, and then frankly, we need to think long term. Um, uh, you know, sitting on a box fan to cool down is probably a good idea, but, Probably not a, a long-term solution uh, when the fire starts or your hair gets caught in it. So um, next slide. 
So um, there are lots of challenges, but we don't need to panic. Uh, we just need to make deci better decisions. The planning and de development, in my mind, are, are the key. Um, dealing with the problems after, after the fact is going to be really expensive, and um, there's always going to be a trade-off. So that's when we get into coastal planning, coastal resiliency, manage retreat, those types of solutions. And, um, and then uh, when necessary, make sure the solutions that we put in are the better ones. So um, sustainable type designs and if absolutely necessary, um, you know, stone redevelopment is better than some of the other solutions out there. Next slide. I am uh, very near the end here. Just want to give a plug for our coastal management unit. Great folks, their, their charge and their job, and they're really good at it is to help local communities make better decisions. They got some great initiatives um, out there in terms of a close, close, uh, resilient Michigan collaborative with local communities, um, a coastal leadership academy to educate local leaders on some of these issues. And then I think uh, in October, there's going to be a new request for a proposal for uh, grants on that. So reach out to them. I think we're going to include some information. That's, uh, that's wonderful. I'm already over my time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. But thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Jared, thank you. Um, we look forward to the Q&A. I'm sure you'll come back up. I want to uh, introduce uh, um, David Bunte. Um, David is a graduate of Illinois State University uh, with an emphasis on marketing and advertising. Majority of his career was in customer service. Uh, I'm sure that has played well. Uh, David is being supervisor of a township. Um, um, he uh, uh, comes from uh, Chicago and also worked in Miami and uh, he was elected uh, the township supervisor in 2016, re-elected in 2020, just in time for the water level uh, challenge. So um, he continues to steer the township uh, through this and beyond. I think uh, uh, I, in, in talking to him yesterday, it looks like the township is moving towards the future using this as a window and, and, uh, and a um, the scaffolding to, to get there. So David, I'm gonna turn it over to you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim, appreciate the intro. And um, also wanna to thank, to thank Flo for the opportunity to participate, hoping that we can use uh, what we've been through here in Chickaming as a case study perhaps in assisting other communities across the state in developing some type of program that we can all live with and uh, support. Um, the first slide, please. Uh, in case you're not familiar with Chickaming Township, we are in the far southwest corner of Michigan. We're in Berrien County, and we have a prop population of approximately 3,200 people. Swells to anywhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 15,000 during high season, which we are in the middle of right now, of course. Um, our Lake Michigan shoreline consists of a little over seven miles. That is entirely residential and public access. We have no commercial uh, property on our coastline. We have seven beach access locations, um, five of which are road and beaches, two are public beaches that we own through the township. The northern boundary of the township borders Warren Dune State Park to the north. And it's a combination obviously of second homeowners, full-time residents, seasonal residents, tourists, visitors, and the main economy for us is tourism, uh, agriculture, a strong movement now to agritourism. Uh, we focus primarily on small businesses and entrepreneurs, food and beverage, entertainment, recreation are all major drivers for our economy here in, uh, in Chickaming. Next slide, please. So as we started to notice uh, the past six years of the ordinary um, rise in the lake levels, um, specifically the summer, the fall, winter of 2019, um, we noticed a series of very strong storms. The fall storms that come across from the Northwest across Lake Michigan, um, they started to extremely degrade our shoreline bluffs. 
the uh, water levels were continuing to rise. The winter of 2019 and 2020, it didn't produce an ice shelf as normal. And uh, therefore we lacked any kind of protection from erosion along our entire shoreline. Uh, we had multiple beach access locations and stairs that were degraded that we had to force closure to uh, two of our beach access points, um, lost the infrastructure associated with those. And then much of the debris that was generated from a lot of our stairs and other vegetation and uh, up and down the coast uh, was washing ashore in multiple locations. As we got in closer to um, the spring, uh, late winter, early spring of 2020, there were uh, numerous applications for revetments as the full effect of the winter was taking hold on most of the properties up and along the shoreline. Um, the application started to increase through Eagle uh, and some of them were getting increasingly large in scale and scope that we had not experienced to date, at least in my tenure. This was all new to me since I'd only been in office a little under four years at that point. At that point also the township was not aware that we were able to challenge any of these permits even though we do have a number of high risk erosion areas along our shoreline and critical dune areas. So uh, once we uh, were made aware that we had the opportunity to object, it threw another dynamic into the entire process for the township and how we would start to begin to look at and evaluate the permit applications that were coming through Eagle and then subsequently through the township offices. Um, also during this time period, in December of 2019, the township was awarded a fairly large grant through the Michigan Department of Natural Resources Trust Fund. Um, we were in the process of trying to expand our public Cherry Beach location by acquiring the three plus acres just to the south of our current beach. And that acquisition was in the neighborhood of four or a little over $4 million. The township and its um, volunteers had raised over $1.6 million in additional grant funding and had approximately 900 individual donors participate in raising the funds for that acquisition. So it was almost like a little perfect storm that we had a public beach. We were acquiring three acres of uh, adjacent land to expand that public beach. And at the same time, we had about four to five feet of actual beach available. Uh, and then we had property owners to the north adjacent that were requesting uh, permit revetment applications be processed that could possibly um, put our Cherry Beach in, in jeopardy. Next slide, please. So as the larger revetment started to be installed on the coastline um, and people were being made more and more aware of the potential um, limitations on accessibility, uh, blocking the access to the shoreline, the public outrage began to grow and uh, additionally, these group, these homeowners to the north of Cherry Beach were installed or requesting install of large revetments. Many of these people um, in the township felt that this would all have a negative impact, not only our township beach acquisition, uh, acquisition project, but on the entire coastline in Chickaming. We've been uh, known for public access with as many access points as we have for being able to traverse um, taking into effect the public trust doctrine and what was discussed earlier. So the, uh, the uh, objections were growing uh, and people were getting more and more vocal about asking the township to act. Next slide, please. So you can see here by these photos and the negative re impact of these revetments that were also being um, unearthed from the past 50, 60, 70 years uh, different levels of types of revetments. Um, it was being debated on social media, of course, that we we're having to then react to, and also at public meetings. The fear was that we'd have multiple levels of um, types of revetments, whether hard armoring or soft armoring, that would impede any access to the lakefront. Next slide, please. And as we approached the fall of 2020, uh, we were getting more and more um, feedback from the township residents and visitors alike, they asked that we take a position on the issue. And the first position the township board took 
in October of 2020 was a resolution in essence that um, substantiated or basis the access to the shoreline is a common form of exercise and uh, mental relaxation and enjoyment for all the citizens and visitors that our economy was staked on our coastline and shoreline uh, and that the township um, in, in our efforts to, to uh, support mental health, safety and welfare of all the citizens and our visitors, we would oppose any action that would include building structures or placement of physical barriers that would interfere with, prohibit, block, uh, prevent anyone from easily walking, accessing or traversing the area below the ordinary high water mark. Um, this was going on in October after that resolution was passed by the township. We were had the fortune to meet up with uh, Dr. Norton and Dr. Meadows uh, and through multiple discussions with them, they were uh, willing to offer an educational webinar on uh, November 12th to the public, to residents of the township that gave a history of our shoreline, uh, the impacts of revetments and the potentially damaging effects these would have not only on our environment, but on our economy in its totality. Uh, at that Zoom meeting, um, we had a little over 125 participants and the education obtained by many that was then shared with others was, um, was very, very impressive. Next slide, please. So the public response to that webinar uh, and the townships board's education that followed uh, had motivated us to agree to develop an ordinance that would give us some greater control over hard armoring and protect uh, what we consider our greatest asset in Chickaman Township. Uh, we're fortunate to engage Scott Howard. He'll be speaking with uh, when I'm completing here and with Dr. Norton's assistance, uh, we did draft then a police power ordinance that is available for viewing on our township website. We held multiple public meetings uh, on the initial draft and subsequent drafts. We had a, a one particular meeting prior to um, passing this ordinance that had nearly 300 participants on a Zoom meeting. And of the 300, more than 70 people spoke with 90% of those that spoke in favor of adoption of the ordinance. So after two months of public engagement and uh, a few tweaks to the ordinance to try to accommodate the best we felt we could, all property owners along the, the lakefront as well and protect their assets uh, the ordinance was passed on February 25th of this year and then was put into effect on April 5th. So in, in a nutshell, uh, our ordinance prohibits the installation and the maintenance of any hard armoring that interferes with or degrades the natural dynamic characteristics of the Lake Michigan shoreline and infringe upon the public trust. So our goal in essence was to afford our coastline property owners, the ability to protect their property in extreme emergency um, with sandbags, HESCO bags, and geotubes. There was some debate on uh, whether these in, in the long term do end up being coming hard armoring, but we felt as a board, it was necessary to give them more than one um, option in order to try to protect their property. The structures then are only to be installed uh, when extreme conditions warrant and only as a temporary barrier. So they'll be an inspected annually. Property owner will be required to remove them if they're no longer serving a purpose or causing damage to a neighboring property or in disrepair or water levels are no longer warrant the need. Permit application process was established and we have engaged a local engineering firm to assist us with monitoring. Next slide. These are some of the supporting documents that were also created with Scott Howard's assistance. Uh, a lot of the information that we obtained and are currently utilizing um, followed Eagle permit documentation. And uh, to date, we have approved two applications and their installations were completed in May of 2021. Next slide, please. And then additionally, to kind of coincide with the development of the ordinance, we created a plan for the entire year it encompassed many projects, all intended to sync the township's current and future planning. So known as our Lakefront Resiliency Project, the following are pieces of that project that are completed, ongoing, 
or planned for the remainder of 2021. So we drafted and adopted the ordinance to ban shoreline hard armoring. We uh, participated in the Michigan Engaging Communities Through the Classroom Project for the first quarter of this year through the University of Michigan and Michigan State. It has a completed a three month course and there is a final draft de uh, developed on environmental planning guidebook for Michigan's Great Lakes coastal communities also available on our website that is an overview of the work that was um, produced during that, uh, that period. Uh, we're also working with the Land Information Access Association known as LEA to draft a chapter in our master plan to amend it. So it syncs with our current uh, documents and then also preparing zoning amendments for the fall of 2021, all part of our entire year long project. Next slide. So finally, here is a sample of one of the revetments that was installed. This is a HESCO bag system put at the toe of a, a, a dune on the northern shore of our coastline. As you can see, this is, does not impede the public. It, is, it would be easily removable, temporary in nature. Um, and also notice the amount of beach we have <laughs> been fortunate enough to get replaced over the course of the past six months. Uh, our Cherry Beach location, which had about 10 feet of beach last year, is now up to 105 feet of sandy beach. So uh, as the lake rises and falls, so does our sand and depositories. Um, but we're fortunate right now to have a lull, but we have to plan for the future. It's an overview of what we did in Chickamee Township. Uh, happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I want to introduce Scott Howard. Let's move to Scott. Um, uh, the township has filled in some gaps uh, identified <clears throat> previously by Jared and Scott can help both address the ordinance gap and I think the uh, the uh, gap in regulatory uh, issues at Eagle. So Scott, I'm going to do a short introduction in light of the time. I've already said who you are and what firm you're with. Um, uh, Scott clerked uh, for Supreme Court Justice uh, Michael Kavanaugh uh, during uh, his reign on the court. He's a cool cum graduate of Wayne State Law School as well as James Madison College at Michigan State. Scott, I'm turning it to you. Thanks, Jim. Um, and uh, I want to start off with a story, a success story. Um, and I like to identify my biases right out of the gates. So I did represent a group of people that were opposed to a proposal that would hard armor 766 feet of shoreline in Bridgman, Michigan, uh, near, uh, near the township that David uh, runs. And that, uh, that application, uh, in that application, a variety of landowners sought to put in a series of revetments that was going to uh, hard armor that long stretch of coastline. Um, my clients were obviously opposed to that and felt that it would impair their ability to uh, observe their public trust rights and there would be long-term detrimental consequences to a large-scale revetment project like that. And at the end of the day, Eagle agreed. They felt um, they followed the science. The, the uh, department followed the science and issued a ruling that held that there was, uh, that the, the permits had to be denied. And, and the ruling was under the uh, Critical Dunes Act, Part 353 of NARIPA, which is one of the statutes that Jared referred to earlier. And within, under that statute, uh, in order to have, uh, to place a structure like these revetments, um, the applicant needs to show that, that they are entitled to a special exception in other words, the status quo is no sort of structures on a critical dune area on the beach. Uh, and you need to show that you're entitled to a special exception because you will have you will suffer a practical difficulty. And what's uh, important about this particular decision is um, the department recognized, number one, the unique nature of the of the area. Number two, the science that uh, indicated the impacts that these the, the pro, that the proposed revetment would have, and I'm reading just a little bit from the uh, decision by Eagle, and it says 
the proposed project will have significant adverse effects on adjacent and or nearby properties and on the natural resources associate, associated with a critical dune area in Lake Townships. In Lake, Town, Lake Townships, shoreline is uniquely intact and functioning at a high level, setting it apart from many other areas in Southwest Michigan. As such, it is important that significant stretches of critical dune area shoreline remain intact to ensure public benefits derived from the critical dunes area identified in the statute. They conclude by saying, rather than protecting the natural functioning of the existing critical dune area shoreline, large boulder revetments will cumulatively result in a permanent negative change. I say this is a, a, a watershed decision because uh, that it is language that we haven't honestly haven't seen from Eagle before. And it shows a very careful evaluation of the specific statutes that the application was made under and their interplay with other statutory provisions under Michigan law. Um, specifically, there is a, a statute called the Michigan Environmental Protection Act or part 17 of NARIPA. And it, it in short states that you're not allowed to pollute, impair, or destroy the natural resources of the state of Michigan unless there are no other feasible and prudent alternatives. And in this case, Eagle recognized that language and the interplay between the two statutes and also recognized that there were a variety of feasible and prudent alternatives, some of which are some of the items that David was talking about soft solutions to uh, preventing erosions like sandbags, HESCO bags, and geotubes. Uh, there were also other alternatives that were required to be explored by the applicants, including uh, moving structures or relocating septic systems if that was appropriate. So uh, Eagle followed the science and reached what, what I feel was very much the correct decision. The uh, interesting, one interesting um, uh, issue that we see along the Great Lakes is that uh, while the, this decision uh, is, is important and potentially precedential for areas within critical dune, uh, designated critical dune areas, it doesn't apply to all of the shoreline of the Great Lakes. Um, part 353 doesn't apply to all areas of all areas of shoreline of the Great Lakes. There are other statutory provisions that do, including Part 353, Part 325. Um, th those are uh, statutory provisions that do provide some regulatory um, reach for the department. But as Jared mentioned, there's also a gap where Eagle is uh, has taken the position based on the advice of the Attorney General that um, activity can happen above the statutory ordinary high water mark. And uh, in those cases, Eagle does not have regulatory jurisdiction uh, over those particular proposed structures. Um, so what do you do in that circumstance? What can communities do in that circumstance? Well, I think that's th that uh, interplays exactly with what Chickaming Township endeavored to do was to take a look at the situation and say, uh, we need to have some local control over what happens along these coastlines, because as David indicated, they are, um, they are why uh, everybody loves that community so much and, and respects it and comes and visits it um, and, and comes back year after year. So how do you protect those special resources? Well, one way that the township uh, can do that is to enact its own ordinance and, and uh, regulations in, in those sort of gap areas as a gap filler. And I think that's exactly what Ch Ch Chickaming has done here um, to, to, I think, uh, great success. And we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A about details about how that all worked. And I, I do wanna to get to that as quickly as possible. So uh, I, I don't wanna belabor the point, but there's a really important gap filling mechanism for uh, munis local municipalities in this case. And there's real opportunities to, um, to be proactive instead, instead of reactive and really protect those shoreline resources in a way that is not permanently damaging. Um, and again, ultimately follows the science. Um, 
with that, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop my talk and just ask that we uh, hop right into Q and A because I think really that's the most beneficial part of these uh, webinars. Well, it's all beneficial, but uh, the Q and A is great stuff, and so I really enjoy that interplay. So I'm gonna cede the rest of my time to uh, questions from the audience. Great. Well, thank you, Scott. And uh, if the other panelists, David and George, you want to join us and pop your face on the screen, if you would, <laughs> thank you. So um, I'm going to just start out. You each get 30 seconds to answer the question, so we can get to the to the uh, people who are participating in Q and A. The question is: um, This gap that exists that the township is filling, um, uh, and the gap that Eagle has to address when those three laws don't apply, uh, Jared uh, described. What uh, what harmonizing standards could be used? So we get the public trust in every case that can be injured. So my, my question is, if we harmonize this and had all these statutes uh, address public trust standards and environmental standards, what would the what would your standard be? You know, one standard, two standard. What would it be if we were to coordinate it into one set of statutes or, or uh, reference other statutes? Go ahead, Jared, since this is statute and this is all policy. Oh. <laughs> hey, no, I, I'm used to Eagle gets the most questions always. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not sure I fully grasped the entirety of the question, but, I, but it, one, one comment I would make re really quickly is that this. You know, um, I understand there, you know, there are these elevations that are placed in the statute, but they sort of ignore that con continuum of shoreline processes impact the lake and the lake impact shoreline processes. And that that is felt, you know, far inland of where those elevations are and even where the um, even where the where the water line is and sort of, you know, if you think about it in in, lo in logic terms, it, it doesn't make sense that we would have less protections when the shorelines and, um, and shoreline development is at its most vulnerable. So the lake is at its sort of its most vulnerable when the water is highest, and then that's when this gap is created. And so uh, I'm not sure that I have a hard answer in terms of like, exactly what that should look like, but, but, but it should certainly incorporate that concept of the continuity of how those things are dependent on. Right. What's the scientific relationship and impacts and have the statutory scheme or schemes uh, reference that? Scott, real quickly, what would what would you say the two most important standards or three of your experience, both in the case before EGO and working with the township ordinance? You know, I think it's as simple as a guiding principle in life is to, to do as little harm to others as, as, as much as humanly possible. So, uh, and I think that's sort of uh, embodied in the Environmental Protection Act. So evaluate those feasible and prudent alternatives. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the Q and A's. There is a question uh, on the floor here. Um, I'm gonna start with this. Uh, the lake does not respect boundaries between communities, public that is, or private properties. Should Eagle and Ken Eagle issue a guidance to local entities, of course, the local entities here have already been addressing this, uh, that permits are not allowed for irresponsible decisions regarding the, the building of a home. David, at the local level, uh, and perhaps Scott, how, how are you addressing that problem? I mean, where, where homes should be built? And is your long-term planning at the end of your uh, presentation uh, taking that into account? We, uh, we had already redone our zoning ordinance. We'd spent uh, two and a half years on a total revamp of our zoning ordinance that took into account setbacks on the waterfront. So we'd put in 150 foot setbacks uh, from the ordinary high, to, high water mark, even though we know it's fluid. Um, it was um, at that date and time where we had the entire lakefront drone surveyed and we have maps and mapping them that we utilize that data from that point on um, to, um, to utilize that 150 setback. So that was our goal was to try to make sure that we have no future close um, building of close uh, homes or residents. And then also uh, minimizing 
any kind of small structures or accessory structures too in that in that in that uh, buffer. So. Thank you, uh, Scott. I've got one here for you. I think we'll start with you anyway, and others can have a chance at it. Um, so, um, what can be done? What kind of recourse exists for neighbors? So you've got the public trust and the public rights being damaged, but you've also got other riparian owners that can be damaged. What's their recourse against Armory if there are impacts? So typically, you under Michigan's common law, you would normally see um, folks that would complain about either a nuisance or even potentially a trespass, depending on how one is redirecting water onto, onto a neighbor's property. Uh, but I think that, that really under the common law, um, the remedy would be for somebody to take issue with their neighbor's, um, neighbor's actions under a theory of nuisance, which is the impairment of somebody's use and enjoyment of their own property interests. Um, there, there may also be some, some statutory uh, remedies, um, particularly under the MEPA, um, that somebody could pursue. I haven't seen anybody do that, but, but again, uh, this is all a little bit new territory for us as, as weather and climate changes. Yeah, so on, on MEPA, everybody, that's a citizen suit that allows uh, people to sue for impairment of air, water, natural resources or the public trust. Uh, and if you've got eroded beach and loss of access and loss of uh, bluff, uh, you know, down gradient or littorally down gradient, uh, you could uh, do what Scott has said, evaluate whether or not you have a claim for restoration, which itself, by the way, in my own view, would, uh, would uh, discourage landowners from taking risk or putting homes even near a bluff to begin with because of the potential liability and no doubt eventually the uninsurability of that, knowing the insurance industry when they catch up to this and catch on to it. So, uh, okay, another question. Um, uh, can you provide some uh, information about acceptable soft armoring techniques to protect the bluffs? Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, David uh, and, and then Jared. Jared. David, you left off with that pretty much at the end of your presentation. And then Jared, I'd like you to comment on that. The, uh, the, the three types of soft armoring that we've allowed sandbagging, HESCO bags and geotubes, both are trademarked. Uh, installation. So both of those and the information on all on both HESCO bags and geotubes are available online. There's a numerous number of providers now that are popping up because uh, many communities are now allowing them and they see the benefit and uh, less costly install and that, that they also are removable. Um, so that, that's one thing. But if, if I can assist or somebody wants to send me an individual uh, email, I'd be happy to give them some more information on that. Okay, um, Jared, I got another question for you. Other than that one, um, you'll like this one, I'm sure. <laughs> Why is Eagle issuing permits to communities such as Highland and Boardwalk near South Haven, which is north of Chippewa here, quite, quite a ways north, uh, when renowned geologists have apparently demonstrated, uh, so it's stated here, that armored revetments will likely damage near neighboring properties uh, I think the question is, how can those be permitted and how did the one described by Scott Howard not get permitted? Yeah, so um, it's it's probably a long answer. I'll go as I'll go as quickly as I can. I mean, number one, we implement statutes. And so we within those statutes, we have statutory criteria that that sort of balance out um, all of these factors. This will answer one of the previous qu questions a little bit too is we don't really don't make decisions that can't be challenged in one form or fashion. So there's an opportunity to contest those decisions, almost every decision um, that we make. And we really do believe that we implement the statute the way that it's written and the way that it's intended. So I don't know the particular case that you're talking about. But one of the things I would comment on is there, there is a difference in the types of projects that we're coming in at the start of this crisis and at the end. At the start of the crisis, we were running from uh, project to project with exposed foundations, drain fields that have already come in and the septic tanks about ready to go in. Um, there were these very high risk 
uh, scenarios with very limited um, solutions. And so part of the statutory test, I skipped over this slide, but the statutory test is essentially, do you have to have some type of impact? Is it necessary to, for, to meet your purpose? If you do have to have an impact, um, have you have you picked the solution that minimizes or the alternative that that minimizes um, those impacts? And that is way way boiling it boiling it down. Um, so there are differences between um, a, a home that's about ready to go in or within 20 feet of going in. And towards the end, there were different projects going in. I'm not going to comment on the individual things that we, you know, challenges and things that we still have in, in front of us. Um, but, you know, as the water level is receding and there's beach returning and there's not the same level of risk, there may be other alternatives that are out there like doing something that's a little bit softer that may not have the same level of protection, but can, but can, um, you know, meet that purpose and still protect the property. So I just boiled a really big thing into, <laughs> into something small. But, but the, the, at, the, at the end of the day, these permits are all site specific and it all boils down to that. Um, Scott mentioned it, this, this consideration of alternatives, consideration of need, all of the statutes in some way boil down to that. And uh, um, and so and they have to be individual decisions. That's how the law works. Oh, here's another. Here, here's a couple more questions. Um, we'll try to get in, and then maybe get closing comment. But there are other questions after we need to have any closing comment. Uh, so um, the uh, we Scott, you kind of touched upon this. I'm going to bring it up again. There's a question. Uh, that um, even though an area uh, is not in a critical zone or let's say a high risk erosion area, uh, aren't the cause and effects the same from the vetments? And um, how do you address it? And I think I think you answered that uh, in your presentation, uh, but real quickly. So real quickly, there are um, the answer is generally yes. The the in, you know the impacts are similar um, regardless of whether or not uh, something's in a critical dune. Obviously there's spe site specific scientific analysis that has to go on, but in general, you you'll, you'll see the same sort of scour activity from a revetment. And there's, um, there's, a, there's a sort of alphabet soup of different statutory provisions that may or may not apply. Um, the thing that I think that kind of binds them all together is the Michigan Environmental Protection Act that, you know, Jim and I were just discussing a minute ago. And that's the statute that says you can't pollute, impair, or destroy without um, evaluating feasible and prudent alternatives. Yeah. Thank you. So next question. I'm going to direct this to myself. Um, so very interesting question. Um, uh, is the structures or the legal structures, most of the development structures that we're talking about here, the reviews, uh, is the burden on those who are impacted uh, or is the burden on the applicant? I'm assuming the burden's on the applicant to show no impacts and if there are impacts, no alternatives. Is that a yes answer, Scott and David? Jared? Yes. Yes. Okay. So actually, the burden's on the applicant, but it's a very good question. Uh, because, in fact, if the burden is on those harmed, and I think the question goes to the stuff that's already been done, uh, and I would answer that question this way. If there's been damage and you're looking at a, a, a restoration remedy of some kind that Scott described in his answer, uh, my view is that the public trust uh, is presumed and that if you've destroyed the public trust, the court's there is some precedent in Michigan, it's called the gross seal dredging case, many years ago, that suggests because of the substantial assumed value in the public trust, those that damage it are gonna to have to prove that uh, it didn't do more than de minimis damage. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we're looking in that direction, but really in the, in, in the future, it's, it's looking forward. Um, uh, otherwise, plaintiffs typically have the burden of proof in, in cases, um, uh, including the citizen suit provision that Scott mentioned. So here we go. We're uh, approaching the end here. Um, 
seeing if there's any other questions. Um, uh, we'll try to get to the Gasco Ganges Township. Some people had some questions about how do you figure out where the critical dunes are. I can tell you there's significant mapping charts and, and uh, places you can go for that at Jared's office. <laughs> Contact him. Um, so um, I don't see any other questions here. I hope not. Oh my God, there's some more. Um, okay, so. All right, yeah, how does a person know about revetment applications? Is there a notice application? I think the state does a notice on its, on its uh, webpage, uh, you do it that way. I don't think you do public notices in the paper anymore on these issues. And, uh, and David, uh, do you guys do a notice or is it part of the Open Meetings Act? Uh, part of Open Meetings Act. We don't do a, a notice. We more or less when we get an application permit from Eagle, it goes through all of our departments. So an open issue affected neighbors like in the Great Lakes Bridge Lines Act, they get official written notice or some kind of public notice. That's an issue in terms of accountability and public participation that I guess we all have to look at. Yeah. Mark? So let, let me jump in on that really quick, Jim. We have a public database called My Waters, um, and and then also public notices are within that. Very shortly, we'll have a function within My Waters where people will be able to sign up to receive notice of public notices based on certain criteria. Um, and you know they'll have to decide if that works for them. I mean, we process uh, you know 7,700 permits last year, so you'll definitely want to parse out what you want to see. Um, but that tool is is coming, and and we're really we think that's a really good um, uh, tool to assist. Well, thank you. Well, look, we've almost hit our time uh, precisely. We're a minute over, everybody. I want to I want to uh, thank all of you who registered today and have participated in providing Q and A's. Uh, uh, note the flow here, like other nonprofit organizations working on these Great Lakes wide and specifically this uh, climate change, these broad climate change issues including high water levels. We have an, an extreme interest in, in uh, programmatic goals with this. And so along with all the other work we do, we really appreciate your support in the past and in the future. Um, I wanna just, uh, close, and I want to thank the panelists again. Um, wonderful, and the staff as well. So I just would end with this thought. What, what I'm hearing and seeing here is, uh, first of all, the context here is very large and uncertain. We need to reset where we are in this world from the past. And that's what I'm hearing, particularly what you face, David, and having to catch up. Uh, the second thing I'm hearing is that the physical relationship of construction in critical zones, whether it's Detroit with the flooding, whether it's the design measures for soil erosion, wetlands, all of this is in flux. Where are the new wetlands? Where are the new floodplains? The floodplains are gonna be wetlands in some cases. They're gonna be dry in other cases. So we have a lot to look at. And one of these areas is the coastal zone. And it may be that we need some comprehensive approach to the coastal zone where we harmonize this and people aren't jumping from one gap to the next. It's obvious that public trust is injured and the riparian rights along with it. It's obvious the harm is done. What isn't so obvious is that we can actually look at the science and impacts and forces towards feasible food and alternatives analysis, which actually forces us away from proliferation of arming and destruction of our coastal resources. That we, I think we simply have to go. Remember, infrastructure, you know, Biden's got this, President Biden has this large infrastructure bill. Look at it. You know, there's a lot of gaps, speaking of gaps. And where is infrastructure money going to go? And how is it going to be used? And is it going to be dumped into do it as usual? Or are we really resetting? And I hope this bill uh, doesn't get severed from climate change reality when, 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 when it comes out of the sausage mill. So I'm going to end there. I really, again, appreciate everybody's participation. It seems like um, we've got a lot to do. I love the planning process that uh, David described. I think we need more of that in the Great Lakes Basin. We need to get that information shared to every community and property owner throughout our water source. Good afternoon, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. <laughs>